Today I want to talk with you about women in the Bible that were called queen mothers. The, the Hebrew word for that is gebirah, and it literally means queen lady or queen mother. How many of you have ever heard that before? Oh, Marcella, all right, one person. The queen mother, the queen mother, the queen lady. Oh, you were in the first service, that's why, I get it. Oh, no, no, okay, yeah, yeah. Listen, the queen lady or the queen mother is found 15 times in the Old Testament. The queen lady or the queen mother had great power, influence, and counsel to the king. So basically, when the king would die, the wife would become the queen mother and would sit at the right hand of the king and would actually advise the king. This is how how important and how powerful this mother's position was. She had great power, influence, and counsel to the king, who was just so happened to be her son. This power and influence was not only due to the bloodline. It wasn't just because it was her son. Her greatest influence was to come from her education to her sons, son or sons, which was the highest form of empowerment from the king. The greatest form of empowerment to the king's wife was to educate the children because it was for a much bigger purpose. It wasn't just to teach him because he didn't want to. It was to teach them to rule and reign properly after he passed away. No one knows their sons like a mom does. And no one would know their son like their mother. Hence, it was the king's wife who was responsible to choose which son would reign in the king's place after his passing. Did you know that? She would be the one that would advise and ultimately choose and, and recommend, I mean, the king would make the final say, but the, the wife would be the advisor that would say, this is the one that you should pick. There could be no personal ambition in which the son, the queen mother, would choose. She couldn't be selfish, and it couldn't be for her own personal gain. Even if the son was the most least likely candidate based on birthright, A good example of the most least likely candidate that defied the law of always picking the firstborn son was who? King David. Samuel shows up to promote the next king, and certainly it's the tallest, most handsome firstborn son. But instead, it was the least likely shepherd boy who was an outcast in the family, relegated to taking care of sheep in the field that God would pick. The education, training, and counsel that the queen mother would provide would be key to his, fu- his future fulfillment of the father's desire. So let's take a look at Bathsheba for a moment. You all should know the story. Bathsheba is the woman that King David had an affair with. He sent her husband to the front line, Uriah, to die in battle. Terrible scenario, terrible situation. But God and his love and care for Bathsheba would pick her and her bloodline through Solomon to bring forth the Messiah. Bathsheba would become a queen mother in Israel. She would become the queen mother to the nation, and she would be the advisor to Solomon, specifically Judah. 1 Kings 1, verse 11, we find this story where Solomon's older brother, Adonijah, had decided that he was going to take his rightful place as the next king. He was the older brother. He probably thought, well, Bathsheba and Solomon are illegitimate. My father compromised. Certainly, I'm going to be the one that's going to be king. Now, if you've never read this story, I'm just going to skim the surface on it, and I would encourage you to go read it. It's a fascinating story. But basically, Adonijah throws himself a party. He sacrifices the sheep, he sacrifices lambs, he has a big celebration. He gathers up Joab, David's chief military officer, and one of David's chief priests and advisors who sides with him. He throws this big celebration. He says, I'm the next king of Israel. But something happens. There's a prophet by the name of Nathan. He was one of David's main prophetic seers and advisors. Nathan goes to Bathsheba and instructs Bathsheba to go and counsel the king. Now, I want you to see this. Why? Because of the weight and the power 
that Bathsheba as the wife of the king and the future queen mother would carry. In 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 11, here's what we read. Nathan goes to Bathsheba and instructs Bathsheba to go to the king who's old, King David's old, he's on his last days, and basically says, look, you swore on oath that Solomon would be the next king. And Nathan reminds her that if you don't go and counsel the king, you won't save yourself or your son's life. This is how critical this advice to the king was. Bathsheba would have an ability to protect the crown and save both herself and Solomon, ultimately the lineage of the Messiah. Adonijah had sought to usurp the throne from his father by proclaiming himself king, but David had sworn that Solomon would be the next king. It would be Bathsheba's counsel to the king with the help of Nathan the prophet that would fulfill the promise to both herself, her son, and the line of David. Adonijah was deserving of death for what he did, but Solomon would spare his life so long as Adonijah remained honest instead of being deceptive. Some of you may know the story. Adonijah, as soon as he finds out Solomon's the king, goes to the temple, grabs onto the horn, and basically the horns of the altar, and begs Solomon for mercy. Solomon has mercy and says, look, I'll spare your life as long as you're never deceitful. Again, what happens? Shortly after, in 1 Kings chapter 2, Adonijah comes along and asks to basically tricks Bathsheba into going before King Solomon to get Adonijah to marry one of David's royal women that have taken, who was a virgin who had taken care of him in his old, old age. He was manipulative, and he tried to manipulate Solomon through his mom. Now, that's pretty low. That's pretty low. But it was another setup to ploy Solomon and ultimately overthrow King, his throne, King Solomon's throne, and the only way to get to the king would be through the queen mother. And I want you to notice something that you may have never seen before that I want to point out to you. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 19. Bathsheba therefore went to King Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah. And the king rose up to meet her and bowed down to her and sat down on his throne. Now notice this, and had a throne set for the king's mother. So she sat where? At his right hand. Bathsheba, who was a widow, by the way, would sit at the right hand of King Solomon and advise him and petition him, and he would listen to her requests. She had a, the highest position of honor to the king on a throne at her right hand. Has everybody got that? I'll make a point about this here in a little bit. Solomon, who would ultimately go astray later in life, and there are a lot of reasons for that. I've often asked, what was it that caused Solomon to go astray? No one had wisdom and insight and understanding and riches and wealth like he did. Well, we know, obviously, the, that his lust for women played a big factor in it, but I believe there was even a deeper-rooted issue. Because when God appeared to him and said, ask me anything you want, he asked for wisdom to lead the people which is great and noble, and God honored that and even gave him that and riches. But I believe there's a better request to ask from God. Not just wisdom to lead, but to know the Father's heart and to be like him. Lord, I want to know you beyond anything else. I want to, I want to stay close to you all the days of my life. Because think about it. What do you want to be? A son who walks in intimacy and relationship, intimacy and relationship with the Lord or a great leader? You say, well, I want to be both, but you can't have one without the other. And if you get great leadership and position, even get wisdom, man, you can know all the John Maxwell books, all the leadership books. You can be the greatest executive CEO and have all the leadership principles down and still miss the heart of the father. And that's what would happen to Solomon. And apparently Solomon ultimately would not heed his mother's voice later in life. But early on, he wrote some things that we have to take note of. He learned so much from his mom. So there's no one like a mom. When we look at the Proverbs, we can see Bathsheba's wisdom intertwined into Solomon's heart. You can see Bathsheba written 
in paper through her son in the book of wisdom, Proverbs. For example, Proverbs 1.8. And there are so many of them. Proverbs 1.8, I really love because I think this is pretty applicable to all of our lives. I'm instructing my kids, but there's someone else laying the law down. There's no one like a mom. And I'm going to tell you ultimately at the end of the day what she says is going to go. That doesn't mean I'm passive and resigned. That doesn't mean she's wearing the pants. It means that I'm empowering her, empowering her because of her unique gifts and her unique understanding and the things that she possesses in quality and character from the heart of God that I don't. Because a woman has a lot of things a man doesn't have. Can I get an amen? amen? And the deceptive lie that a man is a woman is so demonic. And ultimately, it's going to come down to a virtuous mother and a virtuous father leading a virtuous family into truth. And we're going to see some real warnings that come from a virtuous mother today that we need in this day and age for our society. So hear the instruction of your father, but you better not forsake the law of your mother. I'll just read through these real quick. We don't have to pull them up, but just listen to me as I read so many scriptures that come about a mother through the heart of Solomon in the, in the Proverbs. When I was my father's son, tender, and the only one in the sight of my mother. Let me tell you something. My eight-year-old son, who's soon to be nine, has the eye of his mother like no one else. He's a mama's boy, but in a good way. He's more, way more like me in personality and wildness and craziness. But there is a love and affection between my son and his mom that is so different than what I have with him. I love him to no end. I love my son. But the mom has this care and attention to him that I don't have. My son, keep your father's command, Proverbs 6.20, and do not forsake the law of your mother. Proverbs 10.1, the Proverbs of Solomon, a wise man makes a glad father, but a foolish son is the grief of his mother. Proverbs 15.20, a wise son makes a father glad, but a foolish man despises his mother. Proverbs 19.26, he who mistreats his father and chases away his mother is a son who causes shame and brings reproach. Proverbs 20, 20, whoever curses his father or his mother, his lamp will be put out in deep darkness. This is why the first commandment with a promise is to honor your mother and father. Now, we could do a whole message on how do you honor your mother and father, especially if they've gone off their rocker and they're crazy. Should we could do a whole message on dealing with crazy in-laws, mother-in-law. But how do you not be a crazy mother-in-law? How do you not be off your rocker? What you realize is that your kids are not your own. Your kids are for a greater purpose and ultimately it's to promote them. And the greatest desire of a mother should be like Bathsheba to sit at their right hand and see them accomplish the purposes and plans that God has called for them. There's so many scriptures in the pro just the Proverbs alone about moms. In fact, 19 of them. This type of mother is in full service to God first. You are moms, ladies, single ladies that are going to be married. Listen to me. You are in full service first to God, not your kids. Because if you put your kids before the Lord, even wrap it in nobility, you'll be selfish. You have selfish ambition. You won't really fully release them to the purposes of God. A queen mother is in full service to God first. And though the best interests of her son's growth, character, and maturity, they're important. We have to be, you have to be dedicated to their growth, their character, and their maturity. It's all for a greater purpose. It's to honor God first and train them according to the way that they should go by his design. This would be the case for Mary. Think about Mary for a moment. Catholics clearly call her Mother Mary. Mary at a young age is announced that she'll birth the Messiah, but because of her character and nature and who she was, she didn't have any selfish ambition in her to, to release her son, Jesus, 
to his purpose in the kingdom of God and not be selfish as a mother. Ultimately, it would be for all of us here today. The queen never rules in the king's place, but rather sits at his right hand. Her authority is both authentic, but also dependent, just as we are to Christ. These types of mothers not only train and educate, but they intercede. So notice that Bathsheba, inter she interceded or stood in the gap for her son to take his rightful place. She interceded for the nation of Israel, ultimately for the lineage of the Messiah. How about Elizabeth? How about Mary? How about Hannah is a great example. There are so many women in the Bible. Deborah, there are 19 women that specifically prayed and shifted the tide for the nation of Israel. But there's one other mother that I want to talk about today, one that I've never talked about and you might not have heard much about. I call her the mystery mom. She's the mystery mom known as the mother of King Lemuel in Proverbs 31. Now, there are three theories as to who this woman was. No one knows. She's never mentioned anywhere else. This King Lemuel is never mentioned anywhere else. The name Lemuel means devoted to God. So you must understand right off the bat that the mother named her son who had become a king to be fully devoted to God, all right? So the setup is Proverbs 31, verse 1, makes it very clear that she had a divine utterance from heaven or a vision or an encounter from God to her son to advise and instruct him properly. So a lot of people, there's multiple ideas and commentaries of what, of who these people were. One of them was that it actually was Solomon and Bathsheba. And that Lemuel was a name that she had personally, it was like a, I don't like to use the term pet name, but it's kind of like, you know, my dad, you guys don't know this, but my dad who raised me, he calls me Joe. Anytime, any, hey, Joe, how you doing, Joe? Hey, Joe. Because my middle name's Joseph. So my whole life, he's called, calls me Joe. So it's basically very likely that this proverb is Bathsheba and Solomon, very likely. Some people say it's King Hezekiah, and some people say that it was Solomon creating a fictitious story with fictional characters of himself and his mom. Now, we're going to go with the fact that it's Bathsheba and Solomon today. How's that? You can't prove me wrong. You can't say I'm in doctrinal error today. But I want you to take a closer look at this proverb. Now, we're not going to teach on the virtuous wife today. We're going to allude to her, though. We're talking about the mom, King Lemuel's mom. Proverbs 31 verse 1 makes it very clear that she had divine revelation from heaven for her son. Now, she also writes about what a virtuous woman is. So at the end of the day, this can apply to both men and women. But I want to say something to all the moms here. The greatest thing that you can give to your children is divine utterance and insight and revelation from heaven for your children. Because anything else is selfish. Anything else is of you and not of the Lord. You don't get to vicariously live through your kids. You don't get to make them like you. You get to make them like him. We train a child in the way that they should go not the way I want them or think they should. Now, of course, that doesn't negate spiritual principles and spiritual values, but I'd love to find women like Bathsheba who hear from the heavenly father and instruct both their daughters and their sons. Because in Proverbs 31, you have both. In the first nine verses, it's instructions to the son. And then the rest of the chapters, here's what a real woman or wife should look like. And the only way that she was going to teach that is if she was it. This is the kind of mothers we need in the kingdom of God. This is why I surround myself with great women. Not because I'm insecure. Not because I have to have women around me or because I was such a weak mama's boy. And I've had people say, this is unhealthy, all the women that you have in leadership. And I have a lot of men, just as much men or more in leadership. 
Because women, it's not a sex gender issue. Women are not less than. And there is a submission created order in the Bible. That's the deeper rooted issue. Submitted husbands, love your wives, Christ love the church. Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. So if there's no headship to the Christ, to his lordship, you'll never have proper headship with your husband. It's always the Lord first. And so having women in leadership, the problem was you had dominant controlling women that were living from the result of the curse, which was the battle of the sexes. She will have a desire to usurp your authority and he will have a desire to crush her. That's from the result of the curse. So you say, well, what about the scriptures where women need to be silent and not, and not talk in the church? Listen, it was an oppressive culture to women in those days. A woman could not divorce a man in those days. Only the man could divorce the woman. And all the man had to do was make any accusation. You didn't treat me right. You didn't put out enough. You didn't give me enough. You didn't cook my dinner right for me. All the husband had to do in that day was make an accusation. He could divorce the woman. So Jesus would show up on the scene and one of the first things he would do is he would dismantle this whole thing that a woman's sole responsibility is to get married and to stay at home and be barefoot and pregnant. Women should be homemakers. I taught you that a few weeks back in Titus 2. It's in, man, let me tell you something. My wife is a homemaker. And I understand that many women have to work a job because of finances and the husband and the wife aren't making enough money. But that still doesn't negate you being a homemaker. It still doesn't negate you being your kid's mom. And it, you, would, you should only do it because of necessity, not just because you can't handle your kids, you can't stand your kids. Oh, I'm never going to, I was never made to do that. I get that. It'd drive you crazy. There's a lot of women that are so driven and so passionate and so on the go and that sitting home all day would drive them nuts. But you only get your kids once. And if you don't raise them, who's raising them? Let's, let's think how scary this is. Public school today is not the way it was when I was a kid. Kids are enamored with TikTok and social media and the hookup culture. There are more dating apps than swipe right, swipe, le- swipe left, and let's hook up tonight. We must be our kids' parents. And I'm going to say there's nothing like a mom. And your kids will grow up and go, and then, we, then you can go do some of those other things that you want to do. Ask the Lord to give you the ability to be there more for your kids. And if you bombed it and blew it, we're gonna bring forgiveness today. Forgive us for we knew not what we were doing. But we got boys thinking that they're girls. And it starts at the home. Y'all should be shouting me down right now. I know I'm making somebody mad, but it is what it is. So Lemuel, devoted to God or for God. Now, verses two through seven are the, probably some of the most relevant scriptures in the Bible for our culture today. All right? Let's read them together, starting at verse two, and then I'm gonna break it down for you. What, my son, and what son of my womb, and what son of my vows? Verse three, we'll just read right through to seven. Do not give your strength to women, nor your ways. <laughs> to that which destroys kings. It's not for kings, O Lemuel. It's not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice of all the afflicted. Just pause there for a moment. Let me explain something. Alcohol and singleness is a destructive, disastrous mix. I'm telling you right now, I love y'all. You say, oh, pastor, you're so religious. No, I've been down this road. The minute I start to have one drink, two drinks, three drinks in my singleness, suddenly I find myself uninhibited. I find myself compromising. I find myself doing or saying, this is the warning of the mom. What This whole thing is alcohol and women, but it's not just women in this day. It can go the other, alcohol and men because you got, it's like, oh, this is to the, the son And she's instructing him, look, don't give yourself to women, harlots, pornography. How relevant is injustice, pornography, and drug addiction today? It's everywhere. 
And the boundaries that you might set for yourself are quickly compromised the minute you find yourself intoxicated. Set a boundary, singles. Chances are very likely, most likely, that this whole proverb was written to a single king who was a son. Because you get this whole thing on, here's, find this kind of wife. So if the mom's saying, here's the kind of wife you need, chances are likely he's single. So it's come right out of the gates. Watch, you better watch the alcohol. You better watch the hookup. And so that you don't pervert the justice of all the afflicted. What does that mean? That means that I will exploit other people for my personal gain. The thing about, and I, listen, we want to help you recover if you're struggling with porn. It's a very, one in probably three or four men in this room are struggling with porn right now. It's a real thing. And it's, the, the access to it is like nothing we've ever seen before. Lawlessness has completely gone rampant in our culture. So there's no shame here. Please, for the love, do not fall into shame. Get help. Bring it to the light. Fight. You've got to fight. And I'm telling you right now, singles, the alcohol is one of the fastest gateways to any other drug or any other sexual perversion that you could get yourself into. And there's one area in the Bible where God says, you better run. And I mean, you better, you can't even, no man can be trusted in this one area. You can't even be trusted in this area. Run. Don't try to manage it. Don't try to protect it. Run for your life as fast as you can. <laughs> is anybody hearing me? Amen. This is just not like, oh, be strong. Be strong, sister. You Come on, you be strong. Run for your life. That's the way that the scripture reads. A flee. You are, this is the Lord's story. Like, you are not capable. Run. Cut off your right hand. That's been causing you to pluck out the eye. Lay down the alcohol. Lay down the drugs and the addiction. And I'm not an anti-alcohol guy. I'm not against a glass of wine when you're married with your wife, especially at home. Might make some of y'all's marriage better. I'm not kidding. I meet with couples. They're so staunch, stiff, religious. They got no fire and excitement in their life. And I'm like, go have a glass of wine. I've never said that before in church, but I just said it right now. And if you, if you have an addictive personality and alcohol turns you into a raging, nasty person and you can't have one glass and it turns to a bottle or you are an addict alcoholic, lay it down. You don't need it. Alcohol should never have you ever. You know what you're, only you and the Lord know. It's like you touch one drop, next thing you know, you're a psycho crazy person. Seriously, get the issues resolved. Cut the root systems. You should always be in a spot where you could take it or leave it. I could care less if I have it or if I don't. It's not, it means nothing to me. It's not what goes into a man that defiles him. It's what comes out. So get the issues in you that are going to come out that get magnified through the alcohol out. You understand? Others, let's say this together. Others may, but I may not. Stop comparing yourself to other people. But you cannot tell me two or three shots of tequila does not make your clothes come off. You can't tell me that. Because that was my drink. Listen, I was a nine tequila shot, Cuervo, gold, silver, Hornitos. I don't care what it is. You don't even want to know what Hornitos made me. I live the name. Set the boundaries. What's it worth? A moment of pleasure is never worth a lifetime of destruction and dysfunction. We all have to fight it. I'm not immune. I don't get some special immunity. I don't get a greater immunity that you don't get because I'm Mr. High and Mighty Pastor. 
I'm preaching this message because I live it as much. Don't you think the devil's going to want to come after me as much as anybody in this church? I'm passionate about it because I know how aggressive we have to be men. And women, you have to, look, moms, women, teach your children. Really, verses two through seven is training on immorality, alcohol, temperance, addiction, discernment, fornication, and trusting God at all times and bringing justice. Because this is the thing. The purpose is the justice and being just. If you don't see that, then you'll just be living behavior modification. Because I can sit here and tell you all, you better never drink. That's not the right answer. It's sober-mindedness. Because you can drink, not drink, and still have all, you can be a dry alcoholic. You just, it's already there. The, the alcohol just brought it to the light. The issue is, is this is an injustice if I'm exploiting other people for selfish gain. Because sin always affects everyone around you. It always makes us cancerous and toxic to the people around us. We all must, for the sake of the call of God and Christ's death on the cross, be aggressive to be obedient and to honor God. Think of how important, important obedience is. Think about it for a minute. When the Israelites surrounded Jericho, Joshua said, told the two spies, go to the harlot's house. I almost taught, wanted to teach the message titled, let's go to the harlot's house. Seriously. I once said to a spiritual counselor, I said, man, there's just some things that you just, you just don't ever do. It's like, you know, I'm not ever going to stop and go to a strip club to minister to strippers. And you know what he said? He said, you will if God tells you to. But I won't go alone. And I probably really should send someone else. <laughs> like a woman. <laughs> Right, But the point I'm trying to make is, is they go to spy out the land and there's only one person to save them. That brings the ultimate victory that enables the spies to do it. And then the red cord, the scarlet cord was hanging out the window and the whole family got saved. She was probably hooking up as a prostitute the night before, maybe even the morning. Have you ever thought about that? Go to the harlot's house. But her obedience, whew, man, I feel the Lord on that. Her yes would bring forth, did you know Jesus in the line of the Messiah is a harlot named Rahab? And a woman who was cheated, who, who cheated herself. It's not all David's fault. I mean, yeah, he was the king, but she still said yes. Bathsheba, illicit relationship. He should have died. She probably should have died. The husband was killed. And here comes Solomon. And she gets promoted to queen mother. How does God do that? He picks the most least broken, insignificant person that we would probably ever pick in the natural. And even Solomon would go sideways crazy, but God made an oath. God made an oath. Because you know what Bathsheba's name means? the daughter of the oath. God made a promise and he picks the most broken, outcast, messed up because all it takes is a simple yes. All it took for Rahab was to be obedient because of her. She's mentioned in Hebrews 11 in the hall of faith because of her obedience. So the warnings, mom's, True mothers warn their children, protect their children, set examples for their children. And then I love verses eight and nine, they instruct them in purpose. Look at verse eight, to speak for this voiceless. I would probably say one of the greatest desires for me and for this church should be to fight for the voiceless, the unborn, the children that are orphaned, the, the kids that don't have parents that love God, they're everywhere around us that don't feel like they have a voice, empowering women. I mean, I think if the women in this nation 
would the especially I'm talking about the godly women would stand up against this perverted thing of men being women who really just want to hook back up with men. It's a whole weird thing. It's like I want to be a woman and then I want to hook back up with men. Or the man or the woman wants to be a man to hook back up with a woman. The whole thing is not healthy, it's demonic. And this doesn't mean I don't love the, the trans community. It doesn't mean I don't love elders. I'm going to shout it from the rooftops. I will be the nicest, the kindest, the most loving. But that doesn't mean that I tolerate it or say that it's okay. And the problem is in pulpits across America, pastors don't want to make their voice heard to be, for fear that they're going to shun or push somebody away. I know my heart. Any of them can come here. Gay couples can come here. Cross-dressers can, and they have. Men with platform stripper shoes, men dress as women. But I've said this before, if they come and you stay and God doesn't shift or change you, then I've done something wrong. Because it's not okay to say, just come here and say the same. But when is the timing? I don't know. The guy comes with the platform stripper shoes for three years. Y'all might remember. Three years. The lady pulls me to the side in the in the hallway and says, pastor, pastor, I got, I'm upset. I got to talk to you. I said, what's the matter? What's the matter? She says, you see that guy with the platform shoes? You let him come here? I said, let me tell you the difference between him and you. He's wearing his issues for everybody to see while you hide yours on the inside. But at some point, at some point, I had to say to the man in the high heel stripper shoes, dude, Take off the shoes. Because that's fathering. Real fathers are restrainers. Not just tolerant and accepted of everything. But this is not a love issue. This is a parenting issue. Can I get an amen? Amen. This is the thing. It's like we're so afraid. It's like, no, this has nothing to do with perfect love. In fact, I love you enough to say after three years, dude, come on, man. Have I loved you well? Yes. Have I ever said anything about your shoes in three years? No, you've not said one thing. Well, I'm saying something now three years later. Would you please just consider and please pray to about taking off the shoes? I didn't even command him or tell him to take. I said, dude, will you consider now three years later maybe taking off the platform shoes? Because I got kids here seeing a man walking around in high. I'm talking like stripper shoes, right? And he's like, no, nah, I don't have time to pray about that. I said, well, I'm asking you to pray about it. And I'm, next time you come here, I want to talk to you about it. After three years, guess how many times he's been back? But that's okay. Because I loved him really, really well. I gave the guy three years when other pastors would have booted him out day one. I'm not kidding you. I've had other pastors say, if, if, he walks, if, any, if a man walks in with a purse, trust me, he will be told to leave. I'm like, that's not the Lord, for me anyway. If we can't be a hope to the lost generation, then who are we? We're playing church in our own little utopia echo chamber? Am I right? So when they come in and sit next to you, you better give a big old love. You better hug them. You better care for them. You better treat them well. You better show them what the family of the kingdom of God looks like. Because what are they going to come out of and what are they going to come into? So this virtuous mom, most likely Bathsheba, in verses 8 and 9, let's look at this, says, speak up for those who can't speak for themselves, those that are voiceless, those that are speechless, who are appointed to die. This is our mission, folks, snatching people out of the gates of hell. Verse 9. Open your mouth for the speechless. And in the cause, oh, that was, oh, no, wait, here we go. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and the needy. So notice this. The first several verses is, you better check yourself. The alcohol, the girls, the hookup, the guys. Let's just say, because look, pornography's become even more of an issue for girls and women as much as it has for men. We have to shut it down. Smartphones are killing us. Get safeguards or cut it off and get a dumb phone. I'm not kidding you. Get a light phone. Some, this, if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. You know you, and it's like you can't manage this thing. You can only kill it. You can only kill it. So he speaks purpose. Speak up, judge fairly, defend the poor and the needy. 
But when you're consumed, I want to point this out. When you're consumed, consumed with the other things, you won't do the final things. It goes both ways. Do this, and then you'll be able to do this. But if you don't, you won't. Because I can assure you when I'm self-centered, self-focused, numbed out, checked out, isolated, hiding, I can assure you I'm not doing the other things the way that I should. So again, I'm sure that King Lemuel at the time of his writing was single, and there was a heavy focus on chemical dependency and fornication, but then the mother instructs him on a virtuous woman or a virtuous wife. Now, I'm not going to teach on a virtuous woman today. I would challenge all of you to read it. What I would say is that this whole thing is about making you marriage material and keeping you marriage material. How many of you single ladies would love an awesome, on-fire man of God who's going to lay his life down for you and do all he can to propel you into your destiny and the kids and love Jesus and be flamed on and not be weird religious all the days of their life. Anybody? Okay. Well, what's making you marriage material for that guy? Are you marriageable? <laughs> I know you're available, but are you marriageable? <laughs> See, because think about this. The virtuous mom knows what the virtuous wife is. Why? Because she was once a virtuous daughter. You got to see it. The only way that the king's mother could even teach him what it means to be healthy and what a proper wife looks like is because she was one and she understood it. So I say it this way, a virtuous mom raises virtuous daughters who become virtuous wives. It's cyclical. But they also raise up virtuous sons who are marriage material. Single guys, why would a virtuous wife marry you? Because you're hot? You got a, I mean, it's funny how, what people will marry for today. You got a job? Oh my God, I didn't marry you. <laughs> Just because they, oh, you drive a nice car? I don't know. We marry for all the wrong reasons. We think we're going to have stability because of money and work and how handsome they are, but beauty fades. You can't stop the sag. Money will fade. And at the end of the day, if Jesus is in front and center, it's going to be a rough, 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 rough road. <laughs> so in closing, I'm going to leave you with this. This is my mom's list. Moms make both their sons and daughters marriage material. Moms empower their children to be devoted to God and fully give them to him. Moms are educators. Moms are influencers. Moms are counselors and advisors. Moms are intercessors. Moms sit at the right hand of their sons in purpose. Let me say this to you. If you have a son, okay, and it's the same for daughters, but at the end of the day, a healthy mom is not living selfishly and vicariously for themselves. They're empowering the purposes of their children and their greatest desire, I would believe that the greatest desire for a mom is to see their children fulfill the purpose of God and get to sit at the right hand with them. Now, this doesn't mean lording over unhealthy codependency with your kids. It's leave and cleave, not live through their marriage and tell me all your marriage problems. Stop. This is empowering them for the purposes of God. And you get to see it. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't, you, wouldn't it be awesome to just see your children fully fulfill the purpose of God and get to witness it? And even get to advise them spiritually. Moms are intercessors. They pray. And let me tell you, there's nothing like a praying mama. I can tell you right now, forget the gates of hell. If your mom's praying, it's over. And I want to challenge you, moms, never stop praying. Oh, you pray. I mean, you will move the pray like there's no tomorrow. And you watch what God does. You don't think that God, you don't think that God hears the prayers of a, of a mom? In Hebrews 11, in the Hall of Faith, there's this little line. And the women received their sons back to life again. Elijah, Elisha, the widow of Nain. Jesus walked, just how it happened to show up. He was in Capernaum. The next morning, he walked 35 miles 
and all night long uphill, 700 feet above sea level. He was at 600 feet below sea level. That's 1,300 feet above. He had to climb 1,300 feet, walk almost two days, and show up. He just so happened to show up as the procession was going out of a widow's son. How much does the Lord care about a widow? The queen mother was a widow sitting at the right hand of her son. Now, I know there's deeper spiritual understanding about this that I don't have time to develop. That I, I'm never taught this before. I'm scratching the surface on my own. All I know is the body of Christ is called the bride of Christ, and brides become wives, which becomes moms in the kingdom of God. And in our nature, as the body of Christ, we have mothers and fathers reproducing sons and daughters that sit at the right hand of God. I almost did a teaching on Rachel. I have a whole teaching on Rachel. It's what I wanted to teach on, but God led me this direction. Rachel had a son, the son of her suffering that her husband Jacob renamed to the son of my right hand in order to sit at the right hand of God, it's actually on your left hand. And all of the Benjamites were left-handed fighters. Oh, there's a message there. Study it out on your own. It'd be so fun. We sit at the right hand of God, and the mothers have a special place in the heart of God and in the kingdom. And this, this is why, my friends, and beloved, I empower women in this church. If anybody's got a problem with that, I, I love you. I'm sorry. I know we won't see eye to eye. I'm okay with that. There's a lot of expressions in the kingdom. You just need to understand that we need powerhouse women in the kingdom of God to bring their unique voice. My wife hears from the Lord many times more than I do, and I've learned I better listen to my wife. He who finds a wife obtains favor from the Lord and a good thing. My wife has a voice from the Lord and a keen insight to understand things that I don't always understand. Moms possess an innate ability to discern truth. It's called the mother's intuition. You know what a mother's intuition is? It's a sixth sense for one's child in what they need. And it comes from intense closeness and deep love, spending hours with and thinking about that child. It involves seeing the deep signs Warnings, needs, feelings, desires because of the connection a mom builds with her child. No one observes their child and knows their needs, a child's needs like a mom because no one gets in the trenches with their children like a mom does. And that doesn't mean I don't, get, I don't have to change diapers. I don't get to, uh, you're, you're, this is your job. No, it doesn't work like that. Men, you change diapers too. You do laundry. Look, I do my own laundry. I iron my own clothes. You know why? Because my wife's doing more laundry for kids. If you saw the lo laundry loads that my wife's doing for three kids that dig in ponds and are con every pair of clothes that they have is soiled and dirty to no end every day because they live outside. I was like, if I told my wife you need to do my laundry and iron my clothes, oh my gosh. But there's nothing wrong with women that want to. That's not the point. The point is, is you co-labor together and men, I'm going to say this in closing. What if, you're, what if the real purpose in life was to die for your wife and empower them? Jesus did. And you're like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. My, you don't know my wife, how bad she is. Well, let me just tell you, Jesus's wife, while he was on the cross, was plucking the hair out of his beard and then sticking crowns in his head and then mocking him and spitting him. The very people that Jesus was dying for was killing him. That's how my marriage feels sometimes. And all the men should have said amen. Oh, it's mother's, that's right. I got a message for Father's Day. Let me just tell you. <laughs> Father's Day is right around the corner. Think about it. Jesus is whipped, what, 37 times with a, whips that have glass shards pulling his flesh out. He was silent and he loved better. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. 
Your call is not ministry, career, money. What if your call was to lay your life down for your spouse? And then God loved that so much because you were like Christ. He opened the caverns of blessings for your life. And suddenly your prayers weren't hindered. And suddenly you began to see the promises of God unfold in your life. Took me a long time to get what I just told you. We got more marriage problems going on today. We have marriages in disarray. It's like combusting, selfishness, defensive. It's like, and I've been there. I know what it means to be selfish and defensive. But I'm going to tell you right now, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, and you will find yourself walking in supernatural favor and blessing. Propel your wives to their destiny because Jesus is propelling you to yours. Amen? Let's all stand. I'd like to ask my prayer partners to come up, and I want, we want to pray for you all today. Let me say, first off, there's a lot of, lot of sons and daughters here because it's Mother's Day. Thank you all for coming for your mom. A lot of you here because your mom asked you to be here. But if you really want to make your mom happy, you won't just come on a Sunday morning. You'll give your life to the king. There's no greater desire for a mom than to see their son living in the purposes of God or their daughter. Lay down the alcohol, lay down the hookup, get, do whatever you got to do. Get your life right with the Lord. Stop having a misguided understanding of the goodness of God. He's an amazing God. He's an awesome God. He's so better than anything this world has to offer. So today, here's who I want to pray for. And if any of these things I say resonate with you, I want to ask you to come up and let somebody pray for you. Moms that need to forgive themselves or forgive. You were lied to, cheated on, hurt, or maybe you bombed it as a mom. Maybe in your kid's childhood, you were checked out, numbed out. Maybe you weren't really a good mom. And you know it, and you're full of shame, and you're beating yourself up. Stop. Jesus forgave you, for you knew not what you did. He's already forgiven you. Forgive yourself. So some of you moms in here today need to forgive yourselves. You're walking in shame and beating yourself up about shortcomings and failures. Stop. God's a God of a million chances. He, he gives you chance after chance after chance after chance. And look, even if your kids are grown, you still live by example, which they will see. But there's a whole kingdom of sons and daughters. Here's the great news. I have three kids, 10 and under, that you get to mother. They're going to look at you. When we talk about Rock City and they come here, what do they see? They see you. Some of you will take care of them in child care. Some of you will be with them in junior high. Some of, them, some of you will be with them in senior high. Some of them, you will lead them in young adult ministry. Marriage and family groups and house fires, if we're still around, I get to influence your kids. So if you are angry and you felt like a failure, you need to get some healing today. Please, don't carry this weight anymore. It's not the father's desire. Maybe you've been the daughter or the son that's been the prodigal and you've just treated your parents like garbage. You've just not loved them properly and you did some of those things Solomon said not to do. If you know you haven't honored your parents properly, you need to get some forgiveness today and you need to let go of that and stop carrying it. You need to come up and let somebody pray for you. The next is for those that have lost a child. This is a, a hurt that so many carry. You know, we lost a still, we had a stillbirth child at 32 weeks that we held in our arms. And I know so many of you have had miscarriages and you, or you have a child in heaven. Maybe uh, you have a son or daughter that died. I've done a lot of funerals for sons and daughters. And you're hurt today. This can be for mothers or fathers. Look, look you got to ask Jesus to show you how they're doing and who they're with. You need to know that the Lord loves your children and the Lord's with them. They were never yours to begin with. Did you know that? Children always belong to the Lord, devoted to God. And if you've been carrying that hurt and pain, please don't take it home today. This is a house of healing. The next thing is for, for women that feel alone and unvalued. I'm sorry. I mean, at least take my apology. That's not the desire of the Lord. Maybe you've been beat down. Maybe you've been used and abused, whatever it is. 
Find your identity and value in the Lord. You're not alone. He, he will be your husband. Hosea 2 says, no longer do you call me master. Call me husband. What if the Lord can fill that void for you? He can. And if you're finding yourself alone and not valued and hurting, please find the comfort of the Savior and your husband, the Father. Come up and let somebody pray for you today, all right? And anybody that's sick or distant from the Lord that doesn't know him, we want to pray for you. So if you need prayer today, I want to ask you to make your way on up to the front. And what I'm going to do is pray for you and dismiss you. We have great prayer partners that are up here. I love you all. I love all the women. I love you moms. Be celebrated today. Know that you have great value, great position, and great purpose in the kingdom of God, all right? So if you need prayer today for any reason, the prayer, the altar is open. And if you want to grab a son or daughter and come up and pray together, or sons, daughters, grab your mom or your dad, come up, let somebody pray for you. And I'm going to pray for you now. Lord, thank you so much for mercy. Help us to forgive. Help us to forgive ourselves, God. Help us to forgive those that have hurt us. And we forgive ourselves, Lord, for the shortcomings and the mistakes that we've made. Thank you, Lord, for healing our hurting hearts. Thank you, God, for valuing us as sons and daughters. Thank you that we're not alone. And thank you so much, Lord, for our parents, for our moms. Thank you for true mothers in the kingdom of God that are full of wisdom and power, that educate, influence, direct, and guide in the kingdom. Thank you so much, Jesus, for being with us today. And I bless everyone here as you celebrate and as you love and as you become. Maybe your mom's not here. You don't have your family. Become. Become who God's called you to become. I bless you all mightily today. We love you, Lord. Thank you so much for who you are to us. We have no other but you. In Jesus' name.